wow, I'm really impressed how many people showed up. I, I thought for the first time, talk I will be just with five people here. So uh, I wish I prepared a bit better, but um, <laughs> maybe it will be interesting anyway. So today um, I want to talk about um, rendering maps um, without the use of a database. Um, I've been already talking on the German Foskis conferences in the last two years about it. Um, just I put them on uh, for, just for reference. Uh, they're probably not very helpful if you don't speak German. But I'll try uh, my best to summarize uh, what I've been doing in the last, I don't know, one and a half years and um, uh, give some pointers um, where I try to head and where I look for collaboration and so on. Um, so I've been talking about, um, when I'm talking about rendering, it's uh, it's all kind of rendering. So it's not strictly related to vector tiles, but this has been like my main focus because I think that, um, that there's an area where, where there's a lot of movement, um, but um, it might actually work uh, in a very similar fashion for bitmaps or for uh, larger rendered maps for like printing and so on. Um, because in the end, I mean, we all have like the same pipeline, but in the end, just the output form is a different one, either it's tiled or it's a large file or whatever. Um, the start of uh, state of the art um, is basically um, always the same. We have um, the OSM planet, um, we're importing it into a Postgres database, and then we're rendering it. This is like that what nearly everyone is doing except for a few exceptions. Um, and the whole awesome and powerful stuff is in Postgres because it's powered by Postgres and it has like all the spatial operation, we can use the, all the geos stuff. It is, um, but on the same side, it's, uh, it's a big bottleneck uh, because um, all, the, um, all the fancy stuff that is in Postgres is not very fast. And all the importing is also a big, big bottleneck. By the way, can you hear me properly or am I too? It's good, okay. Um, and later on, when we're rendering the whole map, it's again a bottleneck. So either we're putting it into Postgres and it's slow, or we're taking it out of Postgres and Postgres itself is not very fast. Postgres itself is fast, but not the whole geospatial stuff. And then we again have to pull it out through network or through socket or whatever, and it's again um, uh, not very efficient. And basically it sucks at any scale. Because for small deployments, it's really annoying because you have to maintain a full import setup, which on small hardware is um, just very slow, takes a lot of time. You need to, to set up uh, like a lot of resources for a long amount of time. And uh, for large deployments, it's also not very great because um, um, yeah, the, the scale of Postgres will limit you at, at some point and you will have to have some read replicas or whatever. To, uh, to maintain or you will have to cache aggressively and then again you don't have like some real-time rendering but more like okay I try to serve most of requests from cache in order to not slow down everything <laughs> and Postgres is really awesome it has like tons of features it has full SQL, it has asset, MVCC, transaction, it has indices, it has whole permission uh, management, it's scriptable you can you can configure a failover with that but this all comes at the cost, limited performance, as I mentioned, as operational cost you have actually to maintain the server, um, it has pretty large memory consumption. And then the question we all have to ask ourselves is, do we really need all of that stuff? Is it really necessary that we have all of these awesome things just to render a map? I mean, sure, if you have like some enterprise-y uh, uh, geo-information system where you want to manage hundreds of users and uh, limit who sees what and you have like very uh, different query types and so on, this might be actually very useful. But if you're just rendering the map, you probably don't need it. Um, and there have been some, some attempts to improve the whole situation. Um, and again, with, with the tools I will be talking in a second about, um, you have basically the same workflow until Postgres, but then you're rendering to vector tiles, basically, so you're generating 
smaller or larger vector tiles depending on, on the use case. Um, again, with the same bottlenecks. Um, but then you're putting it um, into a client, <coughs> sorry, into a um, client-based renderer. So uh, you're basically delivering those vector tiles to, um, to people. And um, so, for example, open map tiles, um, you can get like a set of vector tiles from them in an MB tiles container and just, um, just serve it with a very simple uh, server that just reads this uh, MB tiles file and, and serves it. But basically, all the features are already baked in, so you can't change much after that. So there is like, you can, you can of course style it differently, but you're pretty limited to what already is there. So uh, for example, if something is missing in the map that you need, for example, um, secondary roads on some specific zoom level, you're out of luck, you can't change that anymore. You would have to have another source and then merge tile sets and so on, then this doesn't really improve the situation. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically, this thing, so you, you, only, you only pull uh, a file and, and that's all. And, but there have been some alternative approaches that go like through a full pipe. Um, um, and one of those is, for example, Tipicanoo, uh, which is the software from Mapbox. And um, they basically take an OSM file and turn it into an MB tiles vector tile set. Um, they, they have some pretty clever features to uh, keep the vector tiles small because they have uh, um, different mechanisms to um, remove features which would be uh, at the same positions, for example. So at uh, low zoom levels, um, you, would, you wouldn't have so many points in the vector tiles, which is very crucial to a real-time rendering. Um, it also has a gazillion of options. It's really just, just look at the, at the GitHub page. There's hundreds of switches. It's, um, um, not very easy to understand uh, all the time. Um, but it's also very limited um, to filtering. So it doesn't have all this flexibility that I've been talking before that we have in PostGIS, for example, or with uh, spatial libraries like Geos. Um, so basically, um, you can do like a, for example, if you want a vector type with all the features in there, it's, it's a great source. But if you want to have something that is more suitable to rendering, it's pretty difficult because first you have to render those tiles, then you have to manipulate them somehow, and uh, tooling is still not very, very extensive there. Um, another software that exists is TileMaker from Richard Furthurst. Um, he um, built a scriptable um, tool that works quite similar to Tippecanoe that takes an uh, OSM file and turns it into an MB tiles uh, vector tile set. And it has a lot more flexibility because it can uh, use Lua scripting inside there. So basically you can tell um, TileMaker to call a Lua script for every node, for every way, for every relation, <laughs> and manipulate it with all the Lua uh, features. Um, but the biggest upside is also its biggest downside because it's Lua, so it's pretty slow. The, the whole operation itself to parse the OSM file and turn it into vector types is pretty fast. It's a C++ tool, um, quite efficient. Could be, could be better, but it's already quite efficient. But um, this whole Lua thing uh, slows it so much down that it's not really suitable for anything larger than maybe a city or like some bigger district or something like that. And if we look at these things, we, we realize why does one tool need to do everything right? Because basically now I've been talking about time making, about typical new, and they have like some upsides, some downsides. Um, there are also libraries that, that basically do very efficient um, um, uh, OSM file parsing. But I'm under the impression that everyone tries to reinvent the wheel, and we're not really collaborating, although we're generally all doing the same stuff. And because in the end, it's step one, we convert OSM data in some proper geodata format, then we filter it, then we transform and map data to different, um, for example, uh, uh, different projections, not in the geographical sense, but uh, in a sense of, okay, we just need certain features or certain um, parameters or we convert units or something like that. And then in the end, we convert it into target format like vector tiles or bitmap tiles or bigger rendered map. 
So basically, my suggestion is to embrace more of the Unix philosophy that we uh, concatenate tools with one another and um, connect them with the standard Unix pipe. So um, this works as following. There is like some parsing tool that takes the OSM file, puts out a stream. Another tool takes the stream, maps and reduces the data, and puts out a stream that can be passed, for example, to a renderer. Uh, but of course, that sounds very easy, but how can we do that? How can we realize that? And this is, again, with the Unix philosophy, each tool does one thing perfectly or one thing well, and we should focus on that. For that, we need, of course, an exchange data format because we need to pass those streams from one tool to another. Um, maybe maybe let's, let's do shapefiles. Who's for shapefiles? No? No shapefiles, okay. Let's not do shapefiles. Um, I mean, for, for, for GIS people, that might be actually enough because they're regularly or normally doing like smaller data sets or they're already pre-reducing. Um, but for larger, larger file sets, this is not an option. So maybe let's do OSMPBF. Okay, not so much left, and now let's not do OSMPBF. OSMPBF is not really a geodata format. I mean, it has really brought us far, but in all honesty, this is not a suitable format for processing because when a program takes OSMPBF, first step is, okay, we have to go through all this, through this large file for three times just to collect like all the dependencies. We need, uh, I think as of today, uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM to do it all in memory, otherwise it's getting even slower. And it's probably, yeah, it, it's, it's not the right solution. We need, OSMPBF is good for um, showing OSM data or for serializing the OSM data, but it's not good for, um, for geo data in general. And there is also um, one thing that we're not, generally if you're rendering a map, you're not only taking OSM data, but generally you also have some different data sources like natural earth or geo names or whatever that are already pre-processed in some manner, or maybe generalized or so on. So we really need a suitable file, file format which can basically have a superset of, of that stuff. Um, such a file format would need very high performance. So linear writing, parallelizable reads. It needs to be scalable. So small data sets could, should be working, but also huge data sets should work. We need tagging structures, so not like in shapefiles that we have like an attribute table and we have to decide upfront, okay, which uh, keys will we have, but we need like some more flexible tag structure with typed uh, data, um, type data like we need integers or floats or booleans and so on. And also needs to be future proof. So um, we've seen with other formats that um, yeah they're quite stagnant. So let's look at shapefiles. Shapefiles have a moderate performance; they're not that bad. They're binary, um, it's actually quite okay. Not really scalable, two gigs file limits. There are, I think, some tricks to get it to four gigs. Um, they don't have a text structure. They're not really future-proof because nothing has changed in the last, I don't know how many years. Um, Geodation has a moderate performance. The problem with scalability is it's always single-threaded. And um, so it's you can't really read it as a stream because it always uh, starts with a, with a curly brace and ends with a curly brace. So there are some tricks with this GeoJSON sec, uh, the sequence stuff, but it's really more or less of a hack. Um, it has a, a text structure and it's kind of future-proof because you can include additional data into, into GeoJSON. Um, then there's the newish kit on the block, uh, geo package performance, not really great because it's SQLite and uh, SQLite is great for a lot of stuff, but it's not really great to serialize a large amount of data because you're always bottleneck, uh, it's, it's always strictly single threaded and so on. Not really scalable, of course, you can have larger data sets, but it, it, it gets uh, really, really slow. And it has a text structure and it's kind of future proof, it's quite, quite at the beginning. So, if we look at a diagram uh, with the two axes of flexibility and performance, um, we have like kind of solutions in this area. We have things that are very flexible, not very fast. We have things that are less flexible, um, a bit faster. Um, but 
we need something over there. We need uh, something that is very flexible and has high performance so we can do actual stream data processing. Um, and I think that the existing solutions are really suitable. We need something new and we need um, some kind of progress. So we need to reiterate what, what such a file format would need is it needs uh, to be binary. It needs to have uh, blocks that are some kind of streetable so we can pass it to workers while, um, while parsing. Uh, it has to be a single stream, not multiple files like, uh, for example, shape files where it's really difficult to, to pass it around. Um, it shouldn't be SQLite because the yeah, SQLite has its uh, limitations. It shouldn't be overly obscure and it should be open and extendable. And um, after discussing it with several people, um, um, I've came up with a solution um, um, introducing a, a new fa a data format called Spaten. It's, that's German for spade, you know, the, the garden tool. And um, it's, but it's not something super obscure, super new. It's basically um, based on protocol buffers uh, like the OSM PBF format and WKB, which is well-known binary, which also is used by Postgres um, internally. There is an open specification which describes how the format works and um, which has the whole um, protobuf definition files. Um, I've written one um, reference implementation in Go which um, is already connected with some tools I will show you in a second. And um, it's around 50% smaller than GeoJSON, but of course your mileage may vary. That depends highly on the data you're using. And it's still very version zero. So um, there's one implementation. It can also it can change at any corner. It is very extensible. So um, let's talk. It would be great um, if if we meet uh, during the conference. You can you can talk to me. Let's see. Um, maybe we can discuss some things um, how to improve that or if we can extend that to to your use case. Um, and. But the big question is, why, why am I coming up with all of that? What could, what could we do with that? You can already, as of today, um, use it to uh, use my tools, which I built for um, ingesting OSM data and to put out files, um, uh, vector tiles. Um, there, is, there are already tools which are basically uh, spitting out this Spartan format or taking it in. Um, and in the future, we might actually interchange those tools. So, for example, if one day Osmium was supported, we could theoretically use all the optimized uh, power of Osmium to take in all of um, uh, OSM data, spit it out in Spartan format, and uh, use some other tools there. And it doesn't have to be my tools. My tools are just some reference implementations. I'm pretty sure that uh, you people can come up with uh, much better tools um, that will fancify and magically render things uh, to your wishes and that we could interchange tools truly without using a database. So, what does the future bring? Um, I think greater flexibility with less programming work. So, um, we should look, for example, for some uh, mapping language that uh, does like common operations. So, uh, converting, for example, from feed to some same amount, uh, same uh, metric uh, uh, system, for example, um, or to convert data that we need uh, um, to to something that is suitable, for example, um, for a, a vector tile renderer. Um, we could do faster processing with less hardware because we don't have these bottlenecks, and we would have less points of failure. So. Maybe we wouldn't need like a network connected uh, database and so on. Um, there's still lots of stuff to do. Um, let's build this stuff together. Um, let's see what, what the tools can do, what you can do for the tools and what, what your wishes are. And uh, now let's discuss what, what you expect and what you would need um, from, from such a tool chain. That's it, thank you. Hello, Paul Norman, uh, one of the OSM to PG SQL developers. One of the, so just a couple of things. You've mentioned Lua with regards to TileMaker. Yeah. Uh, having worked with TileMaker as well as with Lua in OSM to PG SQL, it turns out that the bottleneck is not, is not the Lua. That's actually 
quite fast. Uh, with FileMaker, it's that it is generating this huge in-memory uh, set of all the vector tiles, which for the planet is, root means you need half a terabyte of RAM or thereabouts, which is, yes. the other thing is, something common to many of these projects is that uh, either they need some persistent database, such as Map, with Mapbox's proprietary cloud-based internal system, or in the case of TileMaker or Tiffany, they've abandoned doing minutely updates and can only regenerate everything at once. Yeah. Do you see your system going that way uh, as well, only being able to generate everything at once? Yeah. I mean, this is this is the idea. Um, I have some experimental stuff that um, writes all the vector tiles at once, just not in memory but on disk. It opens like a ton of file descriptors. I think Tipikanu is doing the same stuff that they open like all the files uh, that are needed for the vector tiles and then rendering everything in one go because it's faster than just jumping in a memory all the time. Um, the issue you mentioned with Timec and the Lua, I think the biggest cost is that they're initializing this Lua interpreter somehow. I think this could be somehow optimized. But uh, I haven't got it to work in, in, a, uh, in a proper manner. And if you don't use some scripting, you're pretty limited to, to, to just very simple filtering, basically. So yeah. yeah. But do you see what you're dealing with eventually being able to consume a minutely diff? Um, sure. I've been uh, thinking and talking about this. Um, this is not the focus for the beginning, because I want to have like a stable uh, process and I want to understand what people need and how we could go into this way of pipeline processing. Of course, in the future, it would be great to consume minutely diffs, but the problem with minutely diffs is they're not complete. You need to have like some kind of augmented diffs, and this is then the end of the problem with the API or with the... With you the, need a database. Yeah, and you need a database. So again, the, the thing I was talking about, let's do it without database. Again, we need some kind of maybe specialized database that reference the objects and so on. I think that would be doable. I mean, tools like Imposum or so do this exa exact stuff that they have like on the, um, additionally to the Postgres database, they have like a on this flat file database that has uh, the, the element caching so they can restore it. Uh, sure, someday, of course, but um, First, we would need some, some storage format on disk to, to make it work, I guess. More questions or suggestions or something completely unclear? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, because you mentioned you have like parse, map reduce, and rendering. Um, I saw you have a Golang library for for your um, format. Yeah. Do you have any like uh, um, incorporation with all, some other like mature MapReduce framework to to load your format or interact with the format? Like um, any? Sorry, it's uh, it's it's not your fault. It's just I think too quiet. Um, Probably, I would just come over to you because I can't hear you properly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. My question is, do you have any other kind of uh, library to to interact with your data format with okay. other mature MapReduce, for example, Spark, no. uh, either Python, Scala, or if so, do you have any uh, benchmarking with all the other formats? Thanks. Um, no, um, I don't have um, another implementation. I just have the Go implementation for now. Um, I want to build a Python implementation because that would enable, for example, also opening um, on this Quarton files in QGIS, for example, because you can pretty easily integrate QGIS with uh, um, or, or Python libraries into QGIS. Um, I don't have benchmarks for that. Um, it is, um, I can show you some benchmarks of my own file format on, and my own library, but I don't have any comparisons with, with um, other file um, formats. So sure, we can we can benchmark this and, and have a look at that. I think that makes sense, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Do you have in mind some process of this format uh, can accept the replacement of, for example, one area with other data? 
Yeah. So um, you can merge to yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a converter tool which uh, can convert between GeoJSON and my file format, and could also work with others. And this can also concatenate files. So um, if you have, um, for example, I built a, a Spartan file with, uh, I think, the geo names, uh, names, because then it's easier to, for example, uh, render a, a, um, a low zoom level map, because then you just take, or you take, I don't know, natural earth for the, for the coastlines uh, and for the rivers, and then you take geo names, and then you can take OSM and so on. And um, this is kind of, um, this is also one, one thing I kept in mind, because it's, I think it's very important to merge uh, different file sources. Yeah, that's, that's what we all do, basically, when, when rendering a map. And um, yes, this, this is kind of possible already. But um, of course, I think this is one of the key components we should really think about and, um, and get it integrated. Yeah, I, I've, I've been doing already this, and I think um, and, and this is a problem that a lot of other tools don't do. So for example, with TimeMac, it's kind of difficult because you first would need to convert to us and PBF. And then and then do it backwards, and this is kind of pointless. So uh, um, yeah, I, that's very important to me. Okay, I think we're out of time anyway. So thank you all. Uh, okay, we can we can discuss. Uh, have we have we one more minute or? Okay, one more minute. Okay, great. I don't want to steal the pause from you. Yeah. Okay. Very quickly, could you show us the link to your? The link. Uh, oh yeah, sure. I will put up the slides. I hope I will upload them somewhere. Um, yeah, it's basically you can you can go onto the Grandine um, uh, GitHub uh, repository. Everything is linked from there, and uh, you can have a look. And if you have any questions, just. Uh, just uh, come to me at the conference, or afterwards, just send me an email, and uh, I'll try to answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice break.